Today I am going to have a wonderful conversation with Professor Parmat Prazuli. Can you please tell us where are we now? Thank you, uh, Dr. Hemraj, uh, for this additional conversation. Uh, you, two of us have, are having all kinds of conversations within the umbrella of Annapurna Abundance, and now you have this holistic ecopreneur um, <coughs> uh, model. model. And uh, I am very thrilled and honored to inaugurate your uh, series. Uh, today uh, is uh, Monday, April 17th, 2023. Uh, I have been traveling from Prescott, Arizona starting on uh, April 5th and this is already 12, 13 days and I have been driving uh, all through the Midwest uh, then Colorado, uh, first Colorado, Arizona to Colorado, then to New Mexico, then Col then again Colorado, then Kansas, then Missouri, Kentucky. I this time I took a country road of Kentucky directly going towards uh, North Carolina. That was an amazing experience. I had never gone inside that, uh, you know, the Kentucky horse and all that uh, country road. Um, and then spend uh, three days in Asheville and Hot Springs area of uh, North Carolina. Uh, I have a very positive uh, impression and that's where the first time in my life I was able to walk on the Appalachian Trail, which I had heard a lot about, but I never had a chance to walk on it. And that's where I walked about four or five miles and when I saw, uh, when I uh, were in Maryland, in the middle town, west of middle town, uh, I also s heard that uh, the Appalachian Trail is right here. So we decided to, to come to the Appalachian Trail and uh, have this first segment of interview right here. So this is one of the spot uh, in the Appalachian Trail that starts somewhere in Georgia and then goes all the way to Maine. And I, oh, I invited you to be here on this spot to understand the Appalachian mountain range that cuts across America and that fortunately uh, that people have been using this trail as a way of pilgrimage, as a way of sorting things out, as a way of building your health, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and uh, on the trail, I met amazing people, which I, I will a little later explain. So anyway, uh, this is one of the shelters. This is one of the signs uh, where there are shelters. People could be camping out here, have their tent uh, and cook here. And then uh, one mile further, there is another cabin. And each area of the Appalachian Trail is governed or supervised by a local club called Appalachian, like this one is Potomac Appalachian Trail Club. And they have the cabin, uh, you will have to uh, get a permission to use the cabin, but not to use the tent, I meaning if you are tenting outside you are fine. So anyway, there, there is a whole ethics and stories around it. I want to know more. And later on, when we go to the Reed office, that is our home base now, uh, they have a whole map of from Georgia to Maine. And we will spot this and you will put it into our uh, narrative in the film, in the uh, <coughs> digital version. Okay. So I also wanted to uh, talk about the significance of what is this period? I call it a period of tumultuous uh, wake-up call, also a crisis multiplier, and more than that, what I am interested in exploring and sharing and teaching uh, whatever needs to be done uh, as an opportunity multiplier to begin rethinking about the human history. What values we thought were important, it is time to rethink. It is time to shed out some of the old patterns of thinking and, and that is due to uh, which I call a diagnostic tool I call the combined climate 
coronaviruses disruptions. So in short, it is CCCDS, and uh, for a scholarly or a historical work, uh, that has been a very good diagnostic tool, which I use with my students, with my friends, with my now uh, uh, communicating to the wider world. So we have gone through 2020, 2021, 2022, and now we are already on the first quarter of 2023. So what we are witnessing is that the coronaviruses are kind of erupting here and there and then kind of going down and erupting again in another form, permission and all this. Uh, but uh, the what I had thought in the very beginning of uh, the beginning of 2020 was that the mother source of coronaviruses of different varieties and they have a potential of really dramatizing how they want to infest and how they want to appear uh, the mother is climate the climate disruption is creating the conditions for coronaviruses to erupt in this diversity and intensity and we are still in the middle of that drama uh, and even if coronaviruses might be a little bit slowing down but as you, we can all of us are experiencing that the climatic disruptions are going more and more intensified uh, so in that context our conversation today will be building on the past experience of my, you know, previous about seven decades. Uh, out of that, uh, about, you know, 28, 27 years were in Nepal and the rest of them uh, are in the United States. But in between, I have then gone back to Nepal and India and travel uh, many parts of the world. Um, so we will build on that past, but we will basically begin to carve out a futuristic path given that we are in the middle of the combined climate and coronaviruses disruptions. Wonderful. So, Professor Pradali, how would you like to introduce yourself? I think you already mentioned some, some portion of it. Yeah. Um, uh, that is, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, at this point in my life, uh, which um, a kind of, I'm in a kind of pilgrimage mindset at this point. <laughs> and, and this Appalachian Trail is one of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming from the Himalayan culture of Nepal, uh, Nepali mountains, uh, the pilgrimage is one of the best part of your life. It is, it is a significant part. If you miss to be a pilgrim uh, in your life, in our culture, we think that person was miserable, meaning did not quite finish all the amazing things that life could be done. And for me, uh, I combine pilgrimage like this one, going to the hot springs, going to the rivers, going to the forest, going to the mountains, and using the trails like the Appalachian Trail. Uh, that is part of our one Hindu, Hindu Buddhist tradition of in your life, you should be visiting as many sacred places through sacred pathways. It's not only the destination, it is also how you are walking. <laughs> What's your state of mind? What's your conversation with the hill, with the forest, with the biota, with the animals? Like that. So I'm in that phase. Uh, but in between, then I meet people like you, other groups, and then even establish some connection conversations and also I combine that with food <laughs> mm. that what like for example here we have a wild um, vegetable it is called um, <clears throat> um, garlic mustard you, you tested that a little bit right it has that sponginess of mustard which is also a, one of the most favorite vegetable in Nepal and also we make oil out of it but it is garlicky <laughs> and also in the reed farm which we will go and explain more uh, there are now just emerging all kinds of chives and garlics and onions and combination of things we will make some 
collect some and you will take it home. So this is the moment, uh, this is April 17, middle of April, uh, the, w the winter had just kind of subsided and the new leaves are coming you can see the new life in the forest and uh, interesting thing I'm observing is in the hottest spring area in North Carolina where they are part of the three national forests the Smoky Mountain the Cherokee Forest and the, I think it's called Pigas something like that right, which joins right there in in hot springs uh, the forest were much more in green and green abundance and leaves and even flowering mm. uh, here it is a little less because we are a little further north so the winter here was a little longer or deeper so anyway uh, so I am uh, wanting to witness this change of season from the winter hard winter to moving towards uh, the springtime so we are right there in the beginning of springtime. So this is an amazing time to be in a new place and also start a new conversation. So as for my country, uh, introduction, I am a pilgrim, I am a professor, I am a, the, a, a person who wants to connect the dots. <laughs> if I can say that again, connecting the dots is a rare uh, talent. Very few people are comfortably connecting the dot because they are more uh, comfortable just picking up one thing like this is my place and I am I don't want to connect to that place or people or cultures or ideas. I somehow have escaped from that. I have always been comfortable and seeking uh, as much as I can. How do you connect the dots of different places? different people, different disciplines, different stories, different narratives and create a more integrative another another dot. And uh, there, there, there's that kind of conversation what I call within the umbrella of a, a bioregional rather than one place specific, one river specific or one forest or one hill specific a bioregional thinking allows for that kind of connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I've been talking with you and and the people in Reed Center about that bioregional scale connecting the dots, so that we can bring the genius of each place for the service of creating a regenerative curriculum mm -hmm. for all learning groups, age-wise, interest-wise, their experience-wise, where they are from, like are they high school kids, are they professionals needing some refresher, you know, three-day gathering, one evening gathering is, is sometimes enough, right? And with Dr. Ham being so skillful on using the knowledge media and the knowledge economy, we can now broadcast this globally. And this is the fascinating idea that he is now really embarking on starting today is why should we limit knowledge and learning, access to knowledge, acquisition of knowledge, use of knowledge, spread of knowledge and learning. Why should we be making it time-wise and space-wise and village-wise and school-wise and library-wise? Now with this media, possibility we can broadcast to the whole world and I am just excited about this and I'm proud of you for thinking this far ahead and very few people also uh, can be thinking like this you see it requires a special form and it also requires a special mm, capacity to connect the dots so I am the connector of the dots I am an anthropologist <laughs> social scientist I'm an educator, I am a pilgrim, I am a traveler and some people astrologically, my father was a big astrologer, he said that Pramod, the, the Jupiter, the planet Jupiter is on your side. The Jupiter is always helping you. So you will be always thinking a little far ahead than your colleagues, he said. It is not because I am special, it is because the planet Jupiter is in my favor. Mm -hmm. That's my planet. Mm -hmm. 
And I was born on Thursday also. So it makes sense. <laughs> you see. So I think that is a good introduction uh, for now. And then uh, after uh, my ideas, you will you will make your own sense of who I am. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about regenerative, regenerative ecology and for layperson, why does it matter? Yes. So, um, basically, we can give a little historical window to this, uh, I would say, uh, let's say, three, five, five terminologies, which I am a professor of, I teach those things. Uh, the first one is regenerative studies. If, you, if we want to take it more scholarly and academic-wise, that there is now a new discipline called regenerative studies. It is not biology only. It is not geology only, it is not geography, it is not education, it's something in the middle. And I am one of the pioneers of that. Then there is the other one called regenerative ecologies. The other one we could say regenerative economies. Oh. Another one we could say regenerative learning, which I am one of the, uh, one of the people who have been working on it. And I also teach a course called regenerative leadership. And now we can even go regenerative food system, <laughs> water system, forest system, you know. I mean, we, are, we are good at creating words and so that the discourse, a frame, because the learners need a new wording so that they can have new eyes. You see, the basic idea is that, not road to memorize, more the open the eyes, show what is the regenerative ecology then is that to appreciate that in nature the regeneration is just part of what nature is okay that for example this tree that we are under mm -hmm. was under snow and it had fallen leaves in february january february and now in march those fallen leaves are all there <laughs> And now in April 17, mm. new leaves have come. Mm. And now in two weeks, mm. if it is a flowering plant, you will see bird. Mm. And now look down. What mm. happened to those leaves that were falling, fallen into, you know, on the floor? Mm -hmm. They are also part of the regenerative story, <laughs> not only the new leaves. Yes. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And he, there comes mm -hmm. all the decomposers, you see, the ants and the microbiome and the mushrooms and all those will decompose those leaf litters and branches, fallen branches, into a new life force, mm -hmm. biomass. Composting. Yeah. The nature does composting itself. Mm -hmm. So the basic idea of regeneration is then in nature there are two processes. One, most of it is it regenerates so that it continues to have life, rebirth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if conditions are not ripe or if there is a disruption, mm -hmm. then the, the reverses, the regeneration reverses and becomes degenerative. Mm -hmm. So at this point, taking that metaphor from nature, we can say that our option after the climate disruption and the coronaviruses and several other arrangements that we had done in global economy like mass transfer of goods from China to all over the, all over the world. Right, that we had almost thought, wow, we can expect that, it will happen. Now we don't have a guarantee mm. that something in the middle will disrupt. Mm -hmm. And even in China now, right, the laborers are saying, wait a minute, why are we producing for the whole world mm. in cheap labor? Why should we be always cheap? Because we go to the market and we need more money, so mm -hmm. our labor should be higher, right, the, the uh, ways should be higher, then China will not be the place to produce those things because it will not be cheap. Mm -hmm. It might go to Vietnam, it might go to Cambodia, and there might be a disruption of petroleum and diesel and gas to support all the shipping, you see. Mm. So, so we have to now think about, due to the disruptions, we might have to think about not a global mass production and mass consumption. That was, we witnessed it at least last 
80 years, 70, mm -hmm. you know, depending upon where you are. Made in China might be phasing out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and made locally in Middletown, Maryland, <laughs> Chitwan, Nepal, <laughs> right? Uh, Barichara in Colombia might be the value, mm -hmm. new value. Not made in China, cheap, mm -hmm. and I'm going to buy it in Walmart, mm -hmm. might not be the new thing. Mm -hmm. What we might be thinking is, wow, that honey mustard, uh, that, that garlic mustard, should be in the menu, in the salad, in the, uh, you know, what, what you make, pesto, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Rather than thinking that I will have my pesto from Italy, mm -hmm. we might have to have a new thinking. Mm -hmm. Is all these things are just wild right here in Maryland, mm -hmm. right now, they are free. Mm -hmm. Why not we collect the chives and garlics and the onions and the wild um, garlic mustard and make a pesto mm -hmm. and spread it on the bread mm -hmm. that is made of rye and uh, <clears throat> right oat and mm -hmm. from here and why not we eat that with pride saying look I have a local food it's right from the earth right near me I could collect it while mm -hmm. And I had hardly to pay for it, just to, you know, uh, clean it and, mm -hmm. and process it. Mm. So that's what it means. So regeneration, now what always was happening in nature, and on that amazing work has been done, and I would like to refer to um, a literature called Bioneers, mm -hmm. and also Biomimicry. So these two schools of thought have brought a lot of understanding of how nature regenerates itself or herself. And now the idea in regenerative studies, regenerative learning,